Taking our 10th spot is Queen Consort Camilla Parker Bowles. Between Camilla recently trending again for arguably hating black people and the unwavering target on her back for reportedly stealing another royal's man once upon a time, it seems Camilla just can't catch a break in the media. The tragic love triangle between her, Charles, and former Princess of Wales Diana was once an absolute spectacle for the world to watch. Before the situation got publicly messy, Charles and Diana married at London's St. Paul Cathedral in July 1981. Fans constantly marveled at the royal duo but while spectators were utterly enamored by Diana's iconic David Emmanuel royal wedding gown, a lot of them were unaware of Charles's attraction to another woman, Camilla, years prior as he stood in the church. The infatuation between the latter two was something of an unspoken secret within the royal family, and only a mere few years following Charles and Diana's tying the knot, the then prince initiated an under the table affair with Camilla. Diana was devastated by this and eventually flung herself into a bunch of one offs, the most popular being her time with the famous horse trainer James Hewitt. Years of beating around the bush with heavily criticized tabloid articles and press leaks resulted in Diana and Charles' separation announcement in 1992. Diana iconically stated, There were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Most recently, Camilla's questionable interaction with a young black toddler has social media users re speculating past royal moments. The Queen Consort paid a visit to the Barnardo's nursery preschool to hand out numerous Paddington Bear stuffies that were left in tribute for Elizabeth II's death. During a moment with the little girl, Camilla lifted her arm by her sleeve, and while some some alluded to Camilla attempting to view the child's bracelet she previously commented on, others criticized the action by labeling her racist, because she seemed inclined to touch the young girl. In the aftermath, three additional clips of other royal family members reportedly exhibiting racist behavior went viral on Twitter, with over 150,000 views, sparking another online race debate as the royals currently face increasing backlash over prejudice allegations made in recent years. Additionally, this wouldn't be the first time Camilla has been called out over this topic either. In 2021, the Duchess of Sussex Meghan Markle talked about the racism she personally experienced from the British media during her Oprah Winfrey landmark interview. While discussing the subject with the TV hostess, Meghan also disclosed the issue of an unnamed royal who made racially insensitive comments regarding the then potential skin color of her and Harry's children, an incident Harry later recalled in the sit down. The subject of the allegations led many to believe Camilla was the guilty party behind the comment. Since the royals have all seen growing scrutiny over their interactions with black people, like Kate Middleton and William, who saw a bigger wave of criticism in March once they were photographed shaking the Caribbean public's hands through a chain link fence, or Charles who recently dealt with a similar PR storm after video footage reportedly showed him neglecting to shake a black crowd member's hand during the viewing wait for Elizabeth's lying in state. Like today's Where Are They Now if you've been keeping up with the royals. Taking our ninth spot is the late King Henry VIII who, according to reports, created the Church of England in order to obtain multiple wives. Allegedly, once Henry grew bored of his marriage to the former queen consort, Catherine, he attempted to warm his way out. But divorce was strictly forbidden by the Pope, so Henry formulated a creative way to annul his marriage. In what could arguably be considered Henry being way before his time, the late monarch created his own church in 1534, known since as the Church of England as aforementioned. Reportedly, this freed Henry from the dead weight of his unhappy marriage, and he later went on to wed five different wives. Two of his former wives, Catherine and Anne, were beheaded at his discretion along the way. Not exactly the most charming thing to do to your wife, honestly. Taking our eighth spot is the late Princess Diana. One of Diana's many messes came from the term Squidgy Gate, which referenced a scorching release from The Sun, the notorious royal scandal publishing company that exposed a private recording of a 1989 photo exchange between the late Princess of Wales and who was known to be her friend, James Gilby. In it, James reportedly endearingly referred to Diana as Squidgy throughout the length of topics they got into, including the way Elizabeth viewed her in the royal family then and Diana becoming pregnant. Naturally, Diana flat out denied the claims of her being romantic involved with James, stating, He is a very affectionate person, but the implications of that conversation were that we had an adulterous relationship, which was not true. Still, the severe damage of yet another royal entanglement was already long said and done. Taking our seventh spot is Sarah Ferguson and her quote, cash for access scandal. Known best as Fergie, Sarah is still reportedly one of the royal family's most provocative members. As Angie's ex-wife, the Duchess of York has involved herself in a multitude of royal scandals ever since the crumble of their marriage, which quickly spoke spiraled into divorce in May 1996. Sarah landed herself in a very sticky 2010 situation when the news of the world caught her agreeing to give access to Britain's then special trade representative and her royal ex-husband in exchange for half a million pounds. An undercover reporter by the name of Mazir Mahmood played a fake businessman in order to record his entire conversation with Sarah, where she was reportedly heard to say, look after me and he'll look after you. I can open any door you want. 
Later on, Sarah profusely apologized for the incident and even admitted that her financial situation was stressful. She also revealed that this admission did not excuse her serious lapse of judgment. Taking our sixth spot is Princess Michael. Married to the Prince of Ken, Michael, and being the first cousin of Queen Elizabeth II, Princess Michael was detailed to have worn a racist brooch during a royal lunch with Meghan Markle in attendance. Michael took the world by surprise when she showed up at the 2017 Buckingham Palace Christmas luncheon, donning a dark African royal brooch, an article which carries offensive ties for African people in regards to exotic cessation. The accessory choice was credited as tone deaf given the fact that Meghan, who was also there as mentioned prior, had been extremely vocal about her difficulties growing up as a mixed female. In the end, the princess's spokesperson issued an apology statement, noting any offense that had probably been caused to the Duchess of Sussex with, the brooch was a gift and had been worn many times before, Princess Michael is very sorry and distressed that it has caused offense. Taking our fifth spot is Queen Victoria. Victoria has been reported to have many controversial relationships over the time span of her former life, mainly because of her and the Indian royal attendant Abdul Karim, a pair who developed a rather strong relationship that turned the heads of many. As broken down in the 2007 Victoria and Abdul movie, Victoria gradually promoted Karim in her inner circle to a high ranking position. And even though many rumors alluded to their relationship, their bond was noted to be strictly platonic. However, when the queen passed in 1901, her family didn't show Karim the same kind of support, as they quickly deported the Indian born servant back to his native country. Even though Abdul's honor to the once monarch through their close connection was short lived, he wasn't her only unexpected companion. In light of the death of Victoria's beloved husband Albert, the late queen placed her trust in a Scottish servant known as John Brown. The relationship was heavily subjected as a topic of discussion in a British court, with many speculating Victoria had even secretly married John. Taking our fourth spot is Edward VIII, who once chose to renounce the throne for love. Sound familiar? Well, in 1936, the UK's monarch announced his decision to wed the former twice divorced American socialite Wallace Simpson. In his decision, Edward faced immediate backlash from the Church of England as their head and the government. In a shocking twist, Edward gave up the throne to his younger brother, King George VI, and this still remains as one of the biggest royal scandals in existence. His Baltimore born lover faced extreme character assassination from the public during her time, as the press brutally classed her as that woman while claiming she planned on seducing Edward to stray him away from his royal duties. However, despite the controversy, the two married in 1937. To make things messier though, there were allegations that Wallace was born intersex. Royal writer Anne Seba penned a biography which alluded the quote, becoming Duchess of Windsor had a raspy voice, square jaw, and a flat chest. While multiple other sources claimed Wallace never menstruated and was infertile. This didn't stop the couple from lavishly exiling themselves in a luxurious cottage named La Moulin de la Trillerie on the outskirts of Paris, and later living in the Bahamas where Edward took place as governor for five years in 1940. Taking our third spot is Princess Margaret. The ill fated romance between Margaret and Peter Townsend made such a spectacle that their tragic love story was crafted into a TV show plotted around their messy journey in the kingdom. Royal family enthusiasts nowadays may be too young to remember Margaret in her prime, however the first season of the near finalized series, The Crown, makes it easy for viewers to imagine what it could have been. As the tale goes, Queen Elizabeth II's lively younger sister ended up falling in love with Peter, a divorced royal attendant 16 years her senior. Through years of tireless debating with her monarch sister and the UK government, the princess was soon ultimately forbidden from marrying the group captain unless she turned over her royal privileges. In the end, Margaret chose to keep her title and royal duties triumphed. Margaret declared a decision to not wed Peter in a since famous 1955 Buckingham Palace statement, whereas Peter was sent away on a Belgium assignment to place distance between himself and Margaret. Taking our second spot is Prince Harry. In what was classed as the most avoidable royal scandal in history, we have the second son of Diana and Charles who showed up to a 2005 costume party dressed as a German authoritarian officer. The red-headed royal even wore a German authoritarian symboled armband, and somewhat unsurprisingly, photos of him dressed in full SS gear took center stage on the son's front covers. But this wasn't the end of his controversies at that point. Words pieced together like billiards and strip were quite uncommon until Harry was photographed playing the game nude in a Las Vegas hotel room. Once again, The Sun published another enlarged image of Harry covering his groin and headlined it, Air It Is. Taking our first spot is Princess Anne. In 2002, late Queen Elizabeth's only daughter Anne and her ex Prince Philip were subjected to a 500 euro fine with an additional 500 euro compensation to pay for the trauma of two families' children who were attacked by her English bull terrier Dottie. Despite the 7 and 12 year old boys not sustaining any major injuries, the brutal incident still dubbed the Princess Royal as the first senior member of the royal family to be convicted of a criminal offense. Now that is a wild scandal. Coming in at number 10, Fits the Mold. 
old. All right, so I think most of us were expecting to hear about some of the ingrained biases that members of the royal family grow to have. In the first episode of the series, Prince Harry revealed that there is a temptation in royal family to marry someone who quote, fits the mold. And I think most of us are aware of this kind of mentality for the royal family and honestly, on a more laid back scale, this is prevalent in most families in the world. There is an expectation to find a significant other who meets a standard that the rest of your family probably instilled in you. The only thing is that, for the royal family, breaking that mold is one, very easy to do, and two, comes with harsh backlash. Prince Harry said, quote, I think for many people in the family, especially the men, there can be a temptation or an urge to marry someone who would fit the mold rather than someone you are perhaps destined to be with. And in my opinion, while most of us would agree that there is absolutely nothing actually wrong with Meghan, she is successful, beautiful, respectful, and seems like an incredibly lovely person, most of that has been undercut by the color of her skin, her choice of profession, and the country she comes from. It's just the truth. Prince Harry added to finish this point that, quote, the difference between making decisions with your head or your heart, and my mom certainly made most of her decisions from her heart. I am my mother's son. And coming in at number nine, learning from the past. Talking about his parents, in episode two of the series, Harry revealed that both he and Meghan, who were both children of divorce, didn't want to make the same mistakes as their parents, which is something a lot of children of divorce and messy marriages can relate to. Harry said, quote, what's most important for the two of us is to make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes that perhaps our parents made. I think most kids who are the product of divorced parents have a lot in common, no matter what your background is. Being pulled from one place to another, or maybe your parents are competitive, or you're in one place longer than you want to be in. You're in another place less than you want to be. There's all sorts of pieces to that. And he is definitely not wrong. As an example, my parents are split up, and I find it a bit harder to relate to people whose parents have stayed together. You also observe your parents, and over time, you can understand and learn the ways they failed their marriages, and sometimes the ways they did some things right. The fear of following in those negative footsteps is a huge relatable factor that I think probably makes Harry and Meghan's relationship stronger than some others in the family who are afraid to lean into their feelings like that. Number eight, unconscious bias. Okay, we've been pretty heavy on this list so far, but it's important because this whole thing is basically love versus duty versus hundreds of years of both conscious and unconscious biases. And the Duke spoke on this quite a bit. He said, quote, in this family, sometimes you're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And there is a huge level of unconscious bias. The thing with unconscious bias is that it's actually no one's fault. But once it's been pointed out or identified within yourself, you then need to make it right. Now, a lot of us who have already learned better or just knew better from the start will jump straight to a point of anger about the biases that are so prevalent in the royal family. But there is also a level of these people are incredibly sheltered and closed off. The royals are kind of in a world of their own. It's not really okay and it's a little archaic, but it is the truth. Harry goes on to say, quote, it's education, it's awareness, and it's a constant work in progress for everyone, including me. He then went on to talk about his past controversy when he dressed up as a member of the World War II National National Socialist German Workers' Party. Now you know who I'm talking about when I say that, right? Because YouTube won't actually let me say their usual name. Just wanna make that clear. We know who we're talking about. Harry dressed up like this at a costume-themed party back in 2005, and he said it's, quote, one of the biggest mistakes of my life. He added that, quote, I felt so ashamed afterwards. And then he explained how he met with survivors and rabbis in order to educate himself on his wrongdoings. Now that's just an example of how the royal family can be out of touch with reality just a little bit. Number seven, spies in the backyard. During the second episode of the series, Megan revealed that paparazzi actually paid her neighbors in Toronto to spy on her. Megan revealed that when the news broke of her relationship with Harry back in 2016, her neighbors in Toronto were paid by members of the press to plant a camera in her backyard. She said, quote, it felt like all of the UK media descended upon Toronto. My house was just surrounded, just men sitting in their cars all the time, waiting for me to do anything. See, Megan, being a celebrity, already has dealt with the press before, but the press surrounding the royal family, they're on a whole different level. And I'm sure the ridiculous controversy of the situation just brought it all to another level on top of that. She continued on saying, quote, my neighbors texted me saying, they're knocking on everyone's door, they're trying to find you. They had paid certain neighbors to put a live stream camera into my backyard. Suddenly, it was like everything about my life was getting so much more insular. All the curtains were pulled, all the blinds were pulled. It was scary. And that element of fear plays perfectly into this next point. Number six, protection. 
but why? A little bit later in the second episode, Prince Harry claimed that members of the royal family asked why Meghan should get special treatment and be protected when the two of them had issue with the actions of the British press, descending on her home, neighbors, and privacy. But not only that, the headlines being pumped out about the couple and Meghan specifically were not just vicious, but were also pretty damn racist. The couple referenced a Daily Mail newspaper headline from 2016 that said, and I quote here, Harry's girl is almost, in brackets, straight out of Compton. Which I could go on a 13 minute rant about that on its own. Harry said that when they brought their concerns to the family, quote, the direction from the palace was don't say anything. He added, quote, but what people need to understand is, as far as a lot of the family were concerned, everything that she was being put through, they had been put through as well. So it was almost like a rite of passage. He said that some of the members of the royal family were like, quote, my wife had to go through that, so why should your girlfriend be treated any differently? Why should you get special treatment? Why should she be protected? And as Harry correctly responded to that, quote, the difference here is the race element. Something pretty much all the other members of the royal family cannot relate to. Number five, formality. Stepping away from that issue for a moment, also in episode two, the Duchess talked about her first first meeting with Harry's brother, Prince William, and his wife, Kate. Meghan revealed that the formality that we see presented to the public every day by the royal family is not just an outward show, but it even carries over behind closed doors as well, which is another example of the reality of royal life. Speaking about her meeting with Kate, Meghan said, quote, I met her for the first time, they came over for dinner, and I remember I was in ripped jeans and I was barefoot. I was a hugger, I've always been a hugger, but I didn't realize that this is really jarring for a lot of Brits. Now, I should say, I am actually British. I was born there and I came here at a young age. All of my family is British, but hugging is not jarring for us. Like, I wanna be clear, British people like a hug as much as the next person. I love hugs. What I will admit here is that there is some kind of ingrained awkwardness, and especially when dealing with the formality of a royal. A hug is probably incredibly out of place for most of them. This segment continued on with footage of Kate and William walking alongside each other with Meghan's voice saying, quote, I started to understand very quickly that the formality on the outside carried through on the inside. Now, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but for someone on the outside, not accustomed to the royal life, putting on this display of royalty for the cameras and the people can probably be very exhausting. And then learning that for the rest of the family, it isn't really a display at all. That would probably be a bit disarming. Number four. But going back to the issues that the family had with Meghan, still in episode two, Harry explained that Meghan's career as an actress skewed the judgment of his family, meaning her choice of profession made most of his family believe that the relationship wouldn't last that long. He said, quote, I remember my family first meeting her and being incredibly impressed. Some of them didn't quite know what to do with themselves, but then the Duke jokingly added, I think they were surprised, maybe surprised that a ginger could land such a beautiful, intelligent woman. Then he jumped back to the reality of the situation, saying, quote, the fact that I was dating an American actress was probably what clouded their judgment more than anything else at the beginning. Oh, she's an actress, this won't last. Number three, rehearsed. Now this next part is something I just assumed happened, but right at the start of episode three, Megan spoke about the BBC engagement interview that the couple did, and she said it was a quote, orchestrated reality show. She explained how the interview itself was pretty much pre-planned. She said, quote, it was rehearsed, we did the thing out with the press, then we went right inside, took the coat off, and did the interview. So it's all in that same moment. When she was asked if the couple were prepped on how the interview would play out, she continued, yeah, but but also like, then there'll be a moment when they'll want to see the ring, so show the ring. We weren't allowed to tell our story because they didn't want it, she added. Which is the interesting part, honestly. I think a rehearsed interview could be expected at the very least. Like, if I married a royal, I would just know that that kind of thing comes with the territory. But to have to leave out the things you do want to talk about does feel wrong. That's where you can see the narrative control that was in place. Number two, tabloid attack. Now, another side to that narrative control comes into play when we talk about negative press. Controlling what the family says is one thing, and that part is relatively understandable when dealing with what is essentially a business that thrives off public opinion. But that also comes with being able to control the news. And in the third episode, the Duchess claimed that salacious stories were planted in the press in the lead up to her wedding to Harry in 2018. And it's very true that during that time, every tabloid you saw had some wild claim about Meghan 
Meghan and Harry. She said that quote, we were playing whack-a-mole every day. Every day it was like, wait, another one popped up? Wait, stop, another story, constant. In the episode, they showed headlines like quote, related to serial killer, along with references to a X and Megan went on saying, quote, they were going through the woodwork and pulling people out to create and plant the most salacious stories that they could. I think she is talking about the press themselves, but the planting of stories part is pretty clearly talking about a play from the palace itself. And in at number one is a secret list. To close out this list on a more cute note, I didn't want to be so like negative the whole time, Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, had a little reminiscing about early on in their relationship during episode one of the series. And they talked about how Harry had this not so little, quote, extensive list of things that he would be looking for in a girlfriend, and I guess eventual wife. Meghan seemed to think that this was adorable, but I mean, she passed the test, so of course she would think that. In the episode, she jokingly and kind of adorably said how, quote, he had a list of apparently of what he was looking for, an extensive list, with Harry jumping on to add, I'm not showing you the list. It was kind of cute, I'm not gonna lie. And you can't look down to read the speech, you have to take the speech up. Because if you did, your neck would break, it would fall off. Yesterday on September 8th, 2022, it was announced that Queen Elizabeth II had passed away at age of 96. She was the longest reigning monarch and she sat on the throne for 70 years. She was and remains a beloved figure in Britain, but with her passing, people have been looking at her life, her legacy, as well as that of her successor. And with the in-depth looks into the past, some secrets start to be revealed. Welcome back to Where Are They Now? I'm your host today, Olivia Kozlowski, and today we are going to be diving into the life of the queen, as well as discussing some of the royal family secrets that are bubbling back up to the surface. Before we dive in though guys, please hit that like button if you enjoy this video, it really does help us out. With that, let's dive right in. Queen Elizabeth II's life took a wild turn quite early on. When she was born, she was never meant to be the queen, but that all changed when her uncle, King Edward VIII, abdicated the crown because he wanted to marry outside of what his role would allow him. This meant that King George VI, Queen Elizabeth's father, was left as his successor. Queen Elizabeth was just 10 years old at this point, and her life was never going to be the same. Queen Elizabeth certainly never expected to take the throne at such a young age. In fact, it is said that she wasn't even aware of her father's declining health. When King George VI passed away in his sleep on February 5th, 1952, Queen Elizabeth and her husband, Prince Philip, were on a royal tour. This tour had them in the Treetops Hotel in Kenya when the news broke, which meant that Queen Elizabeth was one of the last people to know. This left Queen Elizabeth on the throne earlier than she had ever expected, which is an incredibly difficult task to live up to. No one has ever said that being a queen was an easy job. The queen went on to have four children, and while three of them, Princess Anne, Prince Edward, and Prince Andrew, have all spoken highly of their mother, it ironically was the now King Charles III who, in his 1994 biography, lamented that it was essentially the nursery staff who taught him how to play, who witnessed his milestone moments, and who he feels sort of raised him. Aside from these difficult truths, it is also said that the queen felt quite a bit of guilt over being called to serve her country, which meant that she wasn't able to be as active in raising her children as she would have been should she have not been the queen. This goes hand in hand with tales of how frugal the queen was. Apparently, while being worth millions, she's also said to have been on quite the cheap streak. There were even rumors that she refused to allocate any money toward kitchen supplies, which meant that the royal cooks were using pots and pans from the 1800s that still had Queen Victoria's stamp on them. While she was tight with her own budget, she is said to have indulged plenty in her children, perhaps as a way to mitigate her guilt over what we just discussed. A former cleric even said to the Telegraph that, quote, in her own financial matters, she was tight, but she's been very extravagant with her children. She's indulged them terribly. She allowed Andrew and Sarah to build that house in Ascot when there were perfectly good homes available elsewhere. So far as I could see, they couldn't have cared less about the budget, but the queen didn't come down on them. She just paid up, and that was very wrong. On that count, she's guilty in spades. When we look more into the queen and her relationships, this is when the real dark secrets begin to come out. Earlier on in this video, I mentioned Queen Elizabeth's uncle, the one who abdicated the throne, which effectively put her in line when she was never meant to be. This uncle, King Edward VIII, abandoned the throne because he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson. Wallace is an American socialite who had been divorced twice, and as king, Edward was forbade from marrying somebody who had been divorced. There was public and political outrage, and it left him stepping away from this role. This is already bad enough from the standpoint of the royal family, but imagine the standpoint they and the rest of the world had when Edward 
Edward and Wallace were accused of being not sympathizers. Wallace is said to have had a love affair with a member of that hateful group before even meeting Edward, and for Edward he is said to have been very proud of his German heritage. There is certainly nothing wrong with being proud of your heritage, but when it causes you and your wife to take a trip to visit and hang out with Hitler, things become a little dicey. In fact, it is said that Adolf desperately wanted Edward back on the throne so that he could act as a sort of puppet for him. Wallace was also accused at one point of sharing British intelligence with Germany, which which obviously is a huge no-no for many reasons. The 90s were certainly a rough era for the royal family. There was the divorce of Princess Anne from her husband after he had a child outside of their marriage. There was Prince Andrew who divorced Duchess Sarah Ferguson after the whole very strange toe-sucking scandal. Not here to kink shame anyone, it's just not the kind of thing you want to know about the royal family. And then of course we have Prince Charles and Princess Diana's crumbling marriage due to the infidelity, and Princess Diana's death. There have been many a rumour that suggests that the royal family had quite the hand in the death of Princess Diana, and while those could certainly and hopefully are just rumours, no one can deny the strange and cold behaviour that was observed after her death. After Diana's death, the flags weren't even lowered to half-mast until there was public outcry about it. Some believe that had there been no backlash, they might not have been lowered at all. Before Diana's passing, King Charles had long been having an extramarital affair, and it is said that everyone including the Queen knew, and some blamed her for not intervening and putting a stop to it because if anyone could, it would have been her. It's also worth noting that while of course the monarchy is all about family ties, the proper royal chain was shattered long before Queen Elizabeth's uncle abdicated. Back in 2012, 10 years ago, the remains of King Richard III were discovered. This was 500 years after his death, and they were able to do some DNA testing. This testing confirmed that they could not link the remains to any paternal relatives. This means that at some point down the line, someone was having an affair, and a quote unquote illegitimate heir was placed in power. This basically suggests that those in power now are only in that position because of a past, well-hidden secret. While many people in Britain are grieving the loss of their queen, and those sympathies can certainly be felt worldwide, there are also people who are grieving for very different reasons. For others, the death of the queen revived these sort of memories and wounds of the region's colonial past, and it reminded people of the monarchy's role in the slave trade. It's not necessarily the queen that people didn't like, although that does exist too, but it's more about the monarchy and what it stands for in the dark histories and the roles that the royal family has played in historic atrocities. Queen Elizabeth I played a key role in the development of the Atlantic slave trade. Queen Victoria's rule saw the engineering of the potato famine that killed one million Irish people. Charles II and those around him actively condoned and encouraged not only the harassment and displacement, but also the massacre of indigenous Americans. This is just a drop in the bucket of an extremely troubled past. One of the major points that people who don't support the Queen had was how her banking empire supports the continued pillaging of Africa, which comes to a total of about $41 billion a year through secrecy jurisdictions. I'm not saying that anyone is perfect, but I am saying that there are plenty of people out there who have a right and a pretty good reason to not want to support the monarchy or the queen. People are certainly worried for the future of the monarchy, and I can understand why. When Queen Elizabeth II came into her role, the UK held more than 70 overseas territories as part of the empire, but now that number has dwindled to just 14. The monarchy held a lot more power in the beginning of her reign than it does now, and it is no secret that the queen was looked on a lot more favourably than the new king. King Charles has had his fair share of scandals, and in our technological world full of news that can travel fast, these scandals might only cause there to be less support for the monarchy. It is possible that the tides will change, but only time will tell. At the end of the day, Queen Elizabeth II had a long reign, she was adored by many, and I know those who loved her are mourning concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? Meghan Markle was reportedly in London when the former Queen of England passed away. However, most recent reports state that she was actually disinvited from Elizabeth's bedside in her final few hours. I'm your host, Michaela. Let's jump right in. Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex, is an American member of the British royal family and a former actress, due to her marriage to the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry. While she was active as an actress, her most notable portrayal is linked to her starring role in Suits as Rachel Zane. Aside from small screen works, Meghan also works as a blogger and once served as an editor-in-chief for the lifestyle 
brand The Tig before discontinuing in April 2017. Megan was appointed as a World Vision Canada Global Ambassador in 2016 and has worked as a direct advocate for gender equality and the empowerment of women alongside the United Nations entity. She made her marriage to Prince Harry official in a lavish 2018 ceremony guested by numerous celebrities around the world. Following their wedding, Meghan was titled Duchess of Sussex as part of the royals. However, in 2020, the couple stepped down as senior members and relocated to California. Born Rachel Meghan Markle on August 4, 1981, is the mixed race current Duchess. Her father is a Caucasian Irish Emmy winning lighting director named Thomas W. Markle, while her mother is an African American therapist and yoga instructor named Doria Radlin. Meghan also has a stepsister from Thomas' side of the family. Once Thomas and Doria were divorced, Meghan spent a lot of time with her father on sets of Married with Children. As a child, Meghan attended the Hollywood Little Red Schoolhouse and later went on to study at an all girls independent Roman Catholic secondary school in LA called Immaculate Heart High. For university, Meghan was admitted into Northwestern in Illinois, where she graduated with double majors in international studies and theater in 2003. After her completion, Meghan worked as a US Embassy intern in Buenos Aires. Time magazine added Meghan to their 100 most influential people in the world list in 2016. Meghan's romantic affairs prior to Harry started with producer Trevor Ingleson in 2004. These two tied the knot on September 10th, 2011, but eventually split in August 2013 after 20 months. The year after, Meghan began seeing restauranter and Canadian celebrity chef Corey Vitiello. However, their fling only remained intact until 2016. As per reports, Meghan acquainted herself with Harry in London, where she visited to watch her friend and sports star Serena Williams play in June 2016. Soon after, the pair made it official and sparked headlines once their engagement was announced. Meghan became Google's most searched personalities in 2016, and the pair eventually leveled up to fiancé status officially on November 27, 2017. In line with Meghan's engagement to Harry, she retired as an actor. Of course, the two sums marriage followed shortly after, on May 19, 2018 to be exact. The ceremony took place at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, with a guest list of over 600 people, including the Queen and additional family royals of importance. In May of the next year, Meghan and Harry became parents, welcoming their firstborn Archie, and then again with their daughter Lilibet in 2021. Yet if we rewind a bit, in January 2020 we saw Meghan and Harry's announcement of stepping down from their senior member roles in the royal family. This decision meant the pair would be forced to divide their time between the UK and North America. When Meghan spoke to Oprah Winfrey in 2021, there were allegations from the Duchess about racism against the British royal household, and Meghan even made the admission that she nearly ended her life while she was directly a part of the British royalty. Thankfully, Meghan and Harry have found a balance in settling in Riven Rock, California presently. Becoming an actress, girl Growing up brought about some difficulties for Meghan, according to the Duchess. Due to her mixed race upbringing, she hinted that being an actress was not her ideal choice for the mostly label driven industry, where roles are usually given with strict ethnic descriptions. Nevertheless, one of Meghan's pals showed one of her college student films to a manager who broke Meghan into the entertainment industry. Yet, Meghan originally found work difficult to seek because of her ethnicity, as she often described being not black nor white enough to snag one. Eventually, though, Meghan ended up bagging an episode appearance for her general hospital role in 2000. Since then, Meghan has obtained many TV show features, but her official breakout as an actor came with Suits in 2011, which ran for seven seasons from 2011 to 2017. Her prominence only climbed higher in Hollywood when Meghan snagged other small screen works for Fringe, CSI New York, Cuts, Deal or No Deal, 90210, Without a Trace, Knight Rider, and CSI Miami. Her most successful big screen roles were for the 2010 film Remember Me and the 2011 movie Horrible Bosses. If you're enjoying today's WATN, help our channel grow by subscribing. Now, let's discuss where Meghan actually was when the Queen passed and how it relates to what we currently know. As per reports, Meghan's absence wasn't a mistake, especially after finding out that Prince Harry arrived by himself when he went to visit his late grandmother. Apparently, Meghan was not invited to be by her side, and even more, royal expert Katie Nichol detailed that the Duchess understood she was not included when Harry was informed that Elizabeth was on her deathbed, equating to why he was solo for the trip and visit. This hasn't stopped speculations, however. Some assume Meghan bowed out, out of respect for her husband, but other sources are concluding that this decision was made by higher powers in the royal family and Meghan had no say in it. Regardless though, expert Katie also explained that Meghan had agreed to visit the castle at another point in time as she was already stationed in London for work related matters and a since cancelled event prior to the late Queen's death. Like Meghan, Kate Middleton was not in the company of Prince William in Scotland, but she and William clarified that it was because she had to stay back with their three children at Windsor Castle. Still, now there are talks about Meghan possibly not being present for the funeral. Previous British public affairs official Shannon Felton Spence had broken down that the Duke and Duchess were already traveling before the monarchy lost their ruler. But Meghan could very well return to California before the service to be with her two children as well. Shannon has 
stated on this topic, Harry will likely stay in the UK until the funeral. I can't imagine Meghan won't attend, but again, from a human perspective, Meghan was expecting to leave the kids for six days, not weeks, so may not be possible for her to stay the whole time. In a better turn of events though, both Harry and Meghan joined the remainder of the royal family in attendance to greet Elizabeth's coffin on Tuesday at Buckingham Palace. Before her passing, Elizabeth was publicly spotted that same day, appointing the UK's newest Prime Minister, Liz Truss. By the afternoon, the minister had tweeted a response to the palace's statement regarding the Queen's health with, The whole country will be deeply concerned by the news from Buckingham Palace this lunchtime. My thoughts and the thoughts of people across our United Kingdom are with Her Majesty the Queen and her family at this time. As Elizabeth's body arrived in Scotland, the Sussex were in attendance with William, Kate, King Charles III, and freshly appointed Queen Consort Camilla. This marked the couple's first time publicly appearing with William and Kate since March 2020, when pictures of them together were taken for that year's Commonwealth Day. Rumors that Meghan's absence in Scotland was originally due to Kate's decision to stay arose from their heavily publicized sighting. But a Page Six insider dished that William had given the extended invite to his estranged brother and his wife. A royal source expressed their gratefulness for both parties being able to set their differences aside for the sake of the former queen. While there, the royal group viewed the floral tributes and stopped to thank the public in attendance for their support. Meghan herself was quite the social butterfly here, as she chatted with many people, asking them their names and even agreeing to a requested hug from one. And yet, her positivity was dulled by one particular occurrence during the occasion. When she was given a bouquet of flowers by the crowd, one aide attempted to grab them from her to lay at the memorial. But Meghan politely declined by thanking them and requesting to take them over herself. However, there was another senior aide who followed Meghan around when she received additional flowers. This one insisted on taking them and Meghan ended up obliging. A Twitter user sparked commotion on the app when they posted both interactions on their account with the caption, the big guns had to step in when Meghan refused to let go of the flowers the first aide tried to take from her, as she herself wanted to walk them over to the other tributes. Naturally, fans on Twitter were pretty divided over the situation. Some pointed out the fact that it was potentially protocol that the royals immediately hand off the flower to the aides, while others described Meghan's gesture as sweet, among other things. In other news, following Elizabeth's death, the former Prince Charles has become king, and his wife Camilla is now the queen consort. William and Kate now hold the titles of Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge, with future possibilities of becoming the Prince and Princess of Wales. And little Archie and Lilibet from parents Meghan and Harry have now been deemed Prince and Princess because of their grandfather's ascension to the throne. However, Meghan and Harry will most likely not receive any new additions to their current titles. This could be due to their non-use of HRH designations when they step back as senior royals. They still do hold onto their Duke and Duchess titles though, but their kids are technically now a prince and princess regardless. Due to the 1971 changes King George V created from their original traditions of automatic rights with the ascension of a new monarch, the updated protocols in place established that the children and grandchildren granted by the sovereign are automatically entitled to either the Royal Highness or Prince and Princess titles. When Archie and Lilibet were born, they were only the great-grandchildren of a sovereign, which means they had no royal titles. Still, there is a possibility that King Charles can revoke the newfound titles of his grandchildren during his ruling. When Meghan had spoken with Oprah, as Afer mentioned, she explained that the royal family had spoken about adjusting the rules in order to keep Archie from adopting his princely title. In addition to this, Meghan admitted that while she was pregnant with Archie, it was the family's decision not to grant him his HRH and prince positions, which had direct connections to the concerning decision of how quote dark the baby's skin would be at the time. There's also the additional possibility that Archie's parents will choose not to grant the newest titles to Archie and their daughter Lilibet, just like other royals Princess Anne and Prince Edward have previously done with their own children. Prince William just upgraded as a member of the royal family by becoming the newest heir to the throne. This latest successor will now be in line to take over as king right after Charles. I'm your host Michaela, let's jump right in. Currently, the Duke of Cambridge, Prince William is the eldest son of King Charles. William is next in line of succession for the throne following his father's ascension. In his earlier days, William was heavily involved in philanthropy and spent his gap years completing humanitarian work in African countries and Chile. William dreamed of being an army officer originally and even underwent training to make it happen, successfully completing his course at the Sandhurst Royal Military Academy and later commissioned as a second lieutenant. William's interest in the Royal Air Force had him serving as a flight 
flight lieutenant for his country. And he briefly went through intensive training to take on his full time duties of being an air ambulance pilot for the Eastern Anglian Air Ambulance. William was later appointed as counselor of state. William is an avid philanthropist whose involvement has been tied to numerous organizations, providing health care, food, and safety for those who have less privilege. Prior to his marriage to Catherine Middleton, William was honored as the Duke of Cambridge, Earl of Strathern, and Baron Kirk Fergus. William was born in London on June 21st, 1982 to his parents Charles and the late Princess Diana. He had the loving nickname of Wombat as a kid from his parents, which William supposedly despised. When the divorce of his parents was active in 1996, William was severely affected, especially since his mother tragically passed away only a year after. His name was splashed across headlines for every single occurrence in the kingdom, and William loathed the media attention. Eventually, the media caught on to this and stopped reporting him. However, during the harder days, this did not stop young William from excelling in sports and deemed swimming as his favorite hobby. Outside of his pastimes, William dedicated a lot of his time to studying, shooting, skiing, and fishing. As a boy, William was extremely well mannered and a scholar, later moving on to attend the prestigious Eton College. William shared immense love for his grandmother Elizabeth, who in return did the same and ensured William grew up kindly. Following his Eton graduation, William took trips to South America and Africa to do more philanthropy work. Upon seeing the natives' living conditions, he set up trust funds for them. He later returned to Scotland to study geography at St. Andrews University, but by then he wasn't sure of what his career would be. Eventually, William decided on the military to become a cadet. In December 2006, William was commissioned as the second lieutenant in the household cavalry. Four grueling months of training landed William as a Royal Air Force pilot afterward, and William later joined their search and rescue team. His first force mission involved an emergency call from the Liverpool Coast Guard in 2010, in which they required rescuing a man who suffered from a heart attack. The next year, it was a cargo ship rescue in the Irish Sea. By the time 2012 hit, William had graduated as the pilot in command. In 2014, William began his full time pilot job for East Anglia and was forced to undergo training once more for his civil pilot's license. William later donated a hefty amount of funds to the air ambulance, even though his position was a paid one. For internships, William had one in banking and land management, stacked up with his royal duty performances as a prince thereafter his graduation. William was a counselor of state for the first time by the time he was 21, and during his birthday, he accompanied his father on a Wales tour. His own private office followed suit in 2008, given as a gift from Elizabeth, where William returned the favor by embarking on Auckland and Wellington tours on behalf of his grandmother. It was here where he pondered the possibility of starting a political career, but the Prime Minister of Australia deemed it impossible because William wasn't a citizen. His travels didn't quite stop here though. The Prince took a Canadian and US tour with his family and also attended a Canada Day celebration. Three years following this in 2014, William toured New Zealand and Australia again for their Independence Days. William met Barack Obama this same year and voiced his concerns regarding Regarding the wildlife trade. As for the prince's personal affairs, his life has been a large topic of discussion in the media, and his relationship with his then college roommate Catherine Middleton faced constant scrutiny. William was naturally outraged by the media speculations about his personal life and pretty much demanded the paparazzi avoid Catherine, which many assumed indirectly confirmed their former friendship turned more. They were eventually confirmed to be marrying one another in 2010, and their engagement ceremony was held in Kenya away from media and attention. Their wedding, however, took place in Westminster, London back in 2011. After a few hours of tying the knot, William was bestowed with his honorable three titles, Duke of Cambridge, Earl of Strathern, and Baron Carrick Fergus. Catherine and William welcomed their firstborn son, Prince George, in 2012. Following this, their daughter, Princess Charlotte, was birthed on May 2nd, 2015. Some fun facts about William are as followed. Due to his love for sports, he happened to play a major role in the London Olympic Games back in 2012 and was seen being a supported teammate for his members alongside his younger brother, Harry. William also actively raised awareness for preventing HIV the AIDS and constantly touring continents like Africa that were most affected by the disease, assisting with funding several charities who were trying to eradicate innocent people's suffering. William worked for two consecutive days at the Royal Marston Hospital by generating funds and catering support from England's elites to help the children's wings of the hospital. Additionally, with the areas affected by several tsunamis, brothers William and Harry provided financial aid for them as well. Finally, the prince became an essential addition to Africa's active Tush Trust, which conserves wildlife and improves the standard of living of people across the continent. On top of all of this, William plays polo for charitable causes. Now, let's discuss William becoming the newest heir to the throne and how it relates to what we currently know. In light of the untimely passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, there have been some big changes taking place for the newest succession line to the British throne. Once Charles's mother died, he was immediately given the title of king under common law, making him the oldest person to ever inherit the title so far. His wife Camilla is now the queen consort. As the Duke of Cambridge and Charles's eldest son, Prince William now stands at the forefront of being the next heir to the throne. Subsequently, Catherine, 
Catherine, popularly referred to as Kate, will transition to Queen Catherine. The royal couple is now officially the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge, which was confirmed by Kensington Palace and inherited from Camilla, who previously held the title. Their nine-year-old son, Prince George, is now positioned in line to bear the crown behind his father, followed by seven-year-old Princess Charlotte and four-year-old Prince Louis. Additionally, despite Harry's push and official stepping down from being a senior royal to start a new life in California, he is still in line for the throne as well. However, he is only up after William's three children, so many are agreeing that there is a highly unlikely chance that Harry will ever become king. In other news, the prince detailed that walking behind his grandmother's coffin earlier this week reminded him of doing the same with Harry for their late mother, Princess Diana, during her funeral in 1997. At the time, William was only 15 while Harry was 12. Harry recalled the tributes for the queen being similar to the process of burying Diana. William thought back to using his fringed hair as a safety blanket while he trailed behind his mother's casket. In a BBC documentary, William explained how he hid behind his hair while passing thousands of people mourning, wailing, and sobbing as he walked with the coffin. Harry and William also admitted that the decision to stay by their mother's side was done by them both, and Harry described feeling glad to have done so. William remembers the procession of being the hardest thing as well as a very long, lonely walk. He added that they found a quote, balance between him being Prince William and having to do his bit versus the private William who just wanted to go in a room and cry who'd lost his mother. For Elizabeth's service, the newest heir to the throne traveled by the Queen's coffin side as they proceeded from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. Both royal brothers seemed solemn as they followed the coffin, understandably so, as this is a hard time for their siblings and their families. In their company were the Queen's other three children, Prince Andrew, Princess Anne, and Prince Edward, alongside Anne's son, Peter Phillips, her husband, Vice Admiral Sir Tim Lawrence, Princess Margaret's son, Earl of Snowdon, and the Queen's cousin, Duke of Gloucester. Inside the car that was following them was the Queen Consort Camilla, the newest Princess of Wales, Kate, the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan, and the Countess of Wessex, Sophie. The monarch's coffin donned the royal standard and was topped with the imperial state crowning, laying on a velvet cushion and supported by a flower wreath foliage from the Balmoral and Windsor residence gardens. Big Ben had one minute toll intervals while the service was en route to Westminster, where the Majesty's coffin arrived that afternoon and will remain stationed there until the funeral service on Monday, September 29th, 2022.